This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, for our 199th episode, yes, one short of 200, we discuss the post-war thriller The Third Man from 1949, celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. Directed by Carol Reed, written by Graham Greene, music by Anton Karras, starring Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, Joseph Cotton as Holly Martins, Alida Vali as Anna Schmidt, Trevor Howard as Major Calloway, Paul Horbiger, I know I pronounced that incorrectly because there's an umlaut, but beats me if I know what the correct pronunciation will be, as Carl, Ernst Deutsch as Baron Kurtz, Eric Ponto as Dr. Winkel, Siegfried Brewer as Papaskew, Hedwig Bliebtrue as Anna's old landlady, Bernard Lee as Sergeant Payne, and Wilfred Hyde White as Crabbin. Recognition for this movie? The Third Man opened on September 1st, 1949. A little bit ironic. The film would be the most popular in the UK of 1949, eventually grossing approximately $1.1 million in 1949. Outside of Austria, the critics were overwhelmingly positive, and the film would be nominated for three Oscars, including Best Director and Film Editing, and winning for Cinematography in Black and White. It was also the first solo winner of the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, which originally was supposed to start in 1939, but was previously canceled due to the war. So they really only started it up in the post-war era, also tying into tonight's film. The Third Man theme was so popular, it was released as a single in 1949-1950 by Decca in the UK and London Records in the US. It became a bestseller, and by November 1949, 300,000 records had been sold in Britain. In 1999, the British Film Institute voted The Third Man the greatest British film of all time. In 2011, a poll for Time Out ranked it as the second best British film ever. Besides its top ranking in the BFI Top 100 British Films list, in 2004, the magazine Total Film ranked it the fourth greatest British film of all time. In 2005, Viewers of BBC Television's News Night Review voted the film their fourth favorite of all time, the only film in the top five made before 1970. The film also placed 57th on the American Film Institute's list of top American films in 1998, though the film's only American connections were its executive co-producer David O. Selznick and its actors Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. The other two executive co-producers, Sir Alexander Korda, and Carol Reed were Hungarian and British, respectively. In June 2008, the American Film Institute revealed its 10 top 10, and The Third Man was acknowledged as the fifth best film in the mystery genre. The film also placed 75th on AFI's list of 100 Years 100 Thrills, and Harry Lyme was listed as the 37th greatest villain in 100 Heroes and Villains. The Third Man currently holds a 99% rating among critics on Rotten Tomatoes, a 97 score on Metacritic, and a 4.3 out of 5 on Letterboxd. So, Dad, as we begin each week, what is your relationship to this movie? You were watching it at one point, and I watched uh, part of it. That was it. Otherwise, this is the first time I've watched it from beginning to end. I think it was one that I recorded on your DVR years ago when I was still living at the house. And I caught it specifically off of TCM because it was a top 100 film on the AFI list. Otherwise, I really wouldn't have had much of a reason to try and seek this one out. But since I've watched it, I just am surprised how often this film comes up for as simplistic as the film actually is. It's not like overly elaborate. It's a nice thriller. It's got a lot of good auteuristic performances by its technical crew in the filmmaking part of it and also by its actors. So it's one where it's a confluence of things, but it's kind of a film fan's film. Having watched it, I mean, it starts with the script. I remember reading 
in college Graham Greene short stories for a literature class I had. I mean, he was a very competent, well-versed writer. He wrote the novel that or novelette that it was based on, and then he did the screenplay. The dialogue is good. It's not overdone. It doesn't try to do too much. The camera and the cinematography are wonderful. There's so much to like about this film. So other first impressions that you might have had, being as it's your first time? Orson Welles basically being a charming scumbag. (laughs) Okay. He didn't have to act a whole lot. All he did was kind of act like the impression that I had of him as a normal person, except that he had to say lines that were just basically viewer to his sleaze. Yeah, I wouldn't say that his character in this is all that different from Kane in Citizen Kane, other than he has certain dialogue, such as, if one of those dots stopped moving, would you really be that sad? And if I gave you a price for it, would uh, that entice you to be okay with one of them to stop moving? Him essentially playing God in that scene. Yes. It's really the only exposition we get with his character during any course of the film, but by its mere inclusion, you get everything that you need to know about his character except for what he used to be and what those that are closest to him, Holly and Anna, think about him before this, like, turn, supposedly. I I wonder, even though they never give it away, if this was always who he was and he just needed an opportunity to capitalize on this being who he was, or if he truly did have a turn somewhere. Well, and that's one of the unanswered questions, which is, how did he get here? Because obviously people saw something in him to begin with that they liked, and now he's completely off the tracks. So what is the film about? Boy, <laughs> it's it's really, it's well, first of all, you can, you can dissect it a bit, which is, it's about... Uh, the temptation and greed on the part of Harry Lyme. It's Holly's infatuation ultimately with Anna. It's Anna's, I don't know if you want to put it, her love or her loyalty. And overall, it's, it's a film about corruption and greed. It's no different than some of the other films. Let's say Scarface. With Al Pacino, it's just set differently, which is that people act and do things in order to uh, grab the money without any real concern or ethics behind it. It's somewhat surprising to me how often trust, betrayal, and greed has come up so far this season. We've had now consecutive shows on Blood Simple, A Fistful of Dollars, Dr. Strangelove, and this. And in all of them, trust, betrayal, greed, power are central themes to everything that we've been discussing so far this this season. I don't know if I meant to pick it this way, but it just kind of has turned out that way. Good thing that we get a break next week when we do Gone with the Wind. It's because there's nothing wrong with that. At least it's not about power and betrayal, allegedly. Uh, okay. It is, but... Okay. But back to the point, the movie, to me, I think the biggest part that sticks out to me is how much in a... I don't want to put it as, like, post-apocalyptic because that's not really the case, but in this post-war era where you have so many different sectors divided among the main countries that liberated this section of Europe, that trust is as big a commodity as anything else. I mean, I know that Harry's getting his fortune and is in trouble for supposedly dealing diluted penicillin because it's in high demand, but really trust and whom you can trust is just as big in this movie as anything else. Well, as a former criminal defense lawyer, I've always said that there are three things that cause 95% of all disruption and problems. It's sex, it's money, and it's drugs. And when you combine the three of them together, 
do you have a problem? I don't know. And quoting from our last film, it might just be a good weekend in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. So this movie is obviously signature. And when I mentioned that it's kind of a filmmaker's film or a film lover's film for that matter, its signature is often quoted for its use of light and shadow, much in the same way Citizen Kane was done. It's Dutch angles, cinematography, and the famous zither score. Of any of these or anything else, what exactly stood out to you about the film and its kind of technical aspects? I mean, the zither score was was interesting. I don't know if it quite fit with the rest of the film. It it has more of a Eastern European feel to it than anything, and this is Central Europe, Austria. So I I kind of went okay. It's cool, but. I don't know how much it really adds to the story. I guess mine is the cinematography with the light and shadow. Uh, the fact that so much of the character is defined by when they reveal and when they hide. And how dark and light consistently blend back and forth, which almost emphasizes good and evil within the characters. I mean, when when... Harry first comes and shows his face and he's in the light. He's got that wry smile like, hey, friend, I'm here. Uh, and then he runs off and you only see him in the shadows running off. Yeah, certainly that moment where his face is revealed for the first time is one of the signature, I would guess, moments in cinema history it's often shown on any of those like clips of historical highlight reels of film but i think there are plenty of other moments I, obviously that being the most famous but plenty of other moments within the course of the film where they're operating between light and shadow whether it's in the sewers anytime that they've been going back and forth in that anna's apartment is often poorly lit the like the kitchen area is often in shadow and you can see kind of her either going to and coming back. There's plenty of different examples in this one as well. I, however, will beg to differ, given my research on the Zither score, that this is something that was specifically recorded by a Viennese native. And oh. despite the apocryphal okay. stories of how supposedly he came to work on this movie, it was something that they really focused a lot on trying to get right as part of the cultural background of Vienna at the time. And it's supposed to be, despite the zither, I think your issue might be with the instrument as opposed to the score itself, but it's supposed to be very polka-like in its essence. Okay. I, I don't think of Vienna and polka too often, but okay. Well, polka is usually German or Bavarian, and Austria obviously being somewhat closely associated with those. So as an amateur historian, though, was the reflection of post-war Europe kind of accurate for you? I don't see this depicted too often in film, so this is kind of one of those rarer examples that you can kind of draw from. I didn't even realize until I saw the film that there were occupation zones in Austria. I mean, it makes sense. But I didn't realize it wasn't something I even thought about. I'm wondering if that was more of a broad thing across Central Europe, where they kind of met up in the middle, much in the same way Germany was occupied that way. Yeah, I believe there were occupation zones in Italy. I'm not sure about, and I thought in Czechoslovakia, but I'm not sure about, you know, Romania or Hungary or any of those, because those were liberated pretty clearly by the Russians. There weren't occupation zones, I believe, in any of the liberated countries because there would be no reason for occupation in Belgium or the Netherlands, Luxembourg. France. Well, France actually had a participation in it because they were considered one of the occupation zone participants. I understand, but they were still liberated. Correct. And realistically, like, what's the point of occupying Switzerland? Well, Switzerland was neutral. It was never invaded. Oh, that was a joke. Okay. 
I'm glad you had to explain that. Anyway, well, are you ready to give some additional background on this movie? Do you have a plot summary ready for us? I do. The Third Man is a cinematic masterpiece that seamlessly blends noir intrigue with post-war disillusionment creating a gripping tale of mystery and moral ambiguity. Set against the atmospheric backdrop of post-World War II Vienna, the film follows pulp novelist Holly Martins as he investigates the suspicious death of his old friend, Harry Lyme. Director Carol Reed masterfully crafts a world of shadowy alleys and crumbling architecture, enhancing the film's sense of unease. Joseph Cotton delivers a compelling performance as Martins, and every man caught in a web of deception and betrayal. However, it's Orson Welles who steals the show as the enigmatic Harry Lyme, a charismatic and morally complex figure whose presence looms large over the narrative. The iconic zither score by Anton Karras adds a haunting and distinctive layer to the film's atmosphere creating an unforgettable sonic backdrop. As the narrative unfolds, the third man becomes more than a mere whodunit by delving into the moral ambiguity of its characters and the bleak aftermath of war. Reed's masterful use of light and shadow, coupled with Graham Greene's sharp screenplay, elevates the film beyond the confines of traditional noir, making it a timeless classic that continues to captivate audiences with its gripping storytelling and cinematic brilliance. In the hands of Reed and his talented cast, The Third Man remains a haunting exploration of loyalty, deception, and the shadows that linger in the aftermath of conflict. Thank you. Did you know? The Vienna Police Department has a special unit that is assigned solely to patrol the city's intricate sewer system, as its network of interlocking tunnels make great hiding places for criminals on the run from the law, stolen property, drugs, etc. The actors playing police officers in the film were actually off-duty members of that unit. <laughs> Did you know? There are many oblique angles in the movie, where the camera is tilted so the horizon line is not horizontal, to give a feeling of awkwardness and uneasiness. In film theory, these are called Dutch angles, although it should be called Deutsch angles. I see. Yeah, it's a mistake of some translation somewhere because what they were trying to say was Deutsch and somebody mistook it as Dutch. Particularly, they're commenting back on directors like Fritz Lang from the early 1930s, late 20s, who did a lot of this type of angling work, but it's stuck as Dutch angle since then. Did you know? After he saw the movie... William Wyler, a friend of Carol Reed, sent him a spirit level with a note. Carol, next time you make a picture, just put it on top of the camera, will you? <laughs> Did you know? Somewhat apocryphal stories abound regarding Carol Reed discovering musician Anton Karras while scouring Vienna bars and nightclubs. Reed actually heard Karras playing at a production party and insisted the Austrian zither player come to Reed's hotel room and record songs for use for the contract. Later in production, Reed realized he wanted to use Karras' music for the whole film and flew Karras out to London to record the score. Karras became a top-selling musician thanks to the film and opened a nightclub called The Third Man in Vienna, which he ran to the end of his days. <laughs> Did you know? Orson Welles initially refused to do the sewer sequences because he was convinced the bad air would give him some disease. Carol Reed claimed there was nothing to worry about as the smell was a result of disinfectant, not excrement. According to Reed, the apprehensive Wells didn't believe him. And so, since Orson Wells refused to be filmed in Vienna's sewers, his close-ups were shot in London film studios while a body double was used for the wide shots. The resulting footage is said to be about 85% Vienna, 15% London. Did you know? A huge fan of the film, Martin Scorsese wrote a major thesis on it while in film school. He got a B-plus for it. His tutor remarking, forget it, it's just a thriller. <laughs> and so with that, we will take our first break and we will be right back.
Before we jump back into the episode, next week for our 200th episode, we discuss the highest inflation-adjusted grossing film of all time, with Gone with the Wind celebrating its 85th anniversary. Directed by Victor Fleming, written by Sidney Howard, music by Max Steiner, starring Clark Gable, Vivian Lee, Hattie McDaniel, and Olivia de Havilland. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. All right, Dad, we left off at best performance. Who do you have down? Robert Krasker, the cinematographer. That's the part of this film that I thought was the best and created the whole atmosphere of the film. I thought his ability to use both uh, light and dark and shadow and and everything and alternating between close-ups and wide lens and the Dutch angles established more than any character was able to do in this film. I went along a similar line, but I don't have him in my nominees. I have Carol Reed. I know that I default sometimes too often to picking the director over a lot of other categories, but there's so much that falls under his purview. So not only was the cinematography, the production design, the to a degree, the writing under his careful eye, but then to be able to understand and want certain authenticity to post-war Vienna by getting Anton Karras and then having him do the full production of the score. I think there are too many small signature touches on what is obviously Carol Reed's best film for me not to give it to him. And for that matter, getting great, I would say, staging and performances out of his lead actors is also credit to him as well. So I went with Carol Reed. Best secondary? I have Joseph Cotton. I do as well. I thought uh, you know, every time I see Joseph Cotton in something, I, I kind of regret the fact that his career kind of tanked because everything he did, he did well. If my understanding is correct, there was some alcohol problems that kind of tanked his career. It would be shocking. He plays a drunk man in this, Citizen Kane, and I think Shadow of a Doubt fairly convincingly, almost to the point of, I wonder if he was drunk. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a sad situation that we didn't have more opportunities to see his talents, but what we have are so precious and so well performed that I just, I thought he actually had to uh, do the biggest lifting in this film. He had to go from being the uh, rah-rah Harry Lime to, oh my God, and and being the love lorn. And there was a lot of more emotions that he had to convey than, than any other character in the film. What's the line from James Mason in North by Northwest where uh, he's remarking that Cary Grant has to play so many different roles and he does them all somewhat convincingly. That's Joseph Cotton in this movie. He is, for me, part of a, I would say, slightly widening list, the more movies I see, of certain people that whenever they show up in a movie, I'm glad to see them. J.K. Simmons is like that. Anytime J.K. Yes. Simmons shows up, I'm happy to see him. Even to an extent, Walter Brennan, despite his politics, I'm glad to see him. <laughs> it's kind of probably the same or similar to our favorite character actors list that we did a couple of years ago that a bunch of those people would probably be another set of people that would be on the, if they showed up in a movie, I'm happy type of list. Martin Balsam for me, he's like that. Basically 12 angry men has a group of about five or six of them that you just kind of go. Yeah. I was going to say Jack Warden. Yeah. Jason Robards. Yes. I know we're naming all men, but I mean, well, for me, Thelma Ritter was always, whenever she was in something, I thought she always was great. Even so, Joseph Cotton does have the most amount of range, not only for his work in the 40s, but just in the course of this movie. He does have to go from the, I wouldn't say scorned, but upset best friend to a wronged best friend to... A vindictive best friend? Yeah. I mean, he's got so many different 
roles to play within the same course of the movie. I wouldn't say that they they were all the most convincing for me during the course of the film, especially this being my third or fourth watch of the movie. But he does play it probably better than most could have done for the range that he was given. I don't think we get a lot of screen time with Orson Welles to really develop enough of his character for me. I honestly think that this movie could actually be redone, maybe not to the mastery of what this has with all the camera angles and the little flares and different things. But if you basically took the bones of the script and got a couple of more modern actors, put in a few extra little touches to extrapolate out the character development in this, because I think primarily the first act for me is a little bit convoluted and they still don't really explain it. The movie starts to really take off about the point where Orson Welles shows up. And then for me, it kind of takes that downhill turn by that point. You have that such revolving action to the point where, you know, you get a 10, 15 minute sewer chase. And I think that's probably one of the more interesting parts of the film. But up until about that point, which is uh, midway to two thirds of the way through the film, you're relying almost solely on Joseph Cotton trying to figure out this mystery of what happened to his friend and who the third man is, which was Harry Lyme the whole time. Most charismatic for you. Alita Valle. Or Valle. She was beautiful. I had never seen her in anything. I did some research. She had a 70-year career in acting in Italian films. She was an Italian actress, um, but she did a few films outside of Italy. But for the most part, she was in an Italian film that was in seven decades of films. Hmm. So she probably started when she was a teenager and went until she was in her in playing grandma or great grandma in the eight or when she's in her 80s and possibly 90s. Yeah. I mean, that, that's certainly an expansive film history. I don't know. I, there's a part of me that I've never quite figured out her character in this. I think the expositionally, they would want you to believe that she is always loyal to Harry, but she's obviously flirting with Holly during the course of the film. And I'm not sure exactly where she falls on this. I think by the end, they give you some pretty obvious clues as to what her choices were. And I would say her resentment of Holly, but it, there's some ambiguity when it comes to that character. And while I, I'm not exactly convinced by a lot of her performance, she is, I would say the second lead of this movie and becomes kind of a central revolving character by which we interpret exactly who Harry Lime is. Because as much as this is a mystery about figuring out who the third man is, it's also a character study to a degree of who Holly Martins is, who Anna, I think it's Schmidt, is, yeah. and who Harry Lime is. Well, the, the term third man is really an allegory because what it is, is is that Harry Lime is the third man, but the second man is Harry Lime. They're chasing the guy that they think Harry Lime is. And the third man is Harry Lime as he really is. I thought you were going to say he's the third man in their love triangle. No, not really. He is, but that, I mean, that can also apply. But I think to a large extent, both of them are chasing the vision of what they think he is. And in actuality, the third man is who he really was. Most charismatic for me, I don't think I was going to go in any other direction it was the person and the thing from this movie that had the most impact on me coming out of it the first time watching it. And I've specifically gone back to and listened to it on my own outside of this movie multiple times, because honestly, it brings a smile to my face every time I hear it. And it's an unbelievable earworm. And that's Anton Karras's score. <laughs> I figured you were going there. It is the seminal thing that I remember about this movie every time. And I hear it in other things all the time. So am I supposed to be getting you a zither for your birthday? I suppose. I mean, I'll just take that one piece of music. I wouldn't know what the hell to do with a zither if it was. It's like trying to give me your mother's old harpsichord. <laughs> no, I'm or not giving a, you. Auto harp, excuse me. Uh, auto I'm harp. Not, yes, I'm not giving you my mother's auto harp. Not until I'm gone. 
I, I can't make that joke. All right. Anyway. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't, because I can only imagine where it was going. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure you could. Let's move to best scene. I have Martin's arrives. I have the porter murdered, which skips over a whole section of that first part of the movie. But honestly, there's a lot of exposition scenes that that's a very exposition heavy section of the movie that I, I don't as much care for. Then I have Callaway reveals Lime's crimes. I have Lime appearing. I have Lime meeting Martin. So the Ferris wheel and the famous conversation between the two. Then Anna not going on the train. And finally, I have the sewer chase, which is like the last 10 to 15 minutes of the movie. So out of these, what would you say is the best scene? Uh, Lime appears. I have that very close. Like, I'm glad that you went for it because it is a very seminal turning point within the course of this movie. It's very famous. It's got that that obvious turn, and I think the movie really picks up at that point. But I went with something else, so I'll let you go. Well, ultimately, the real the real tip is the cat. Yeah. The cat only liked Harry, and then all of a sudden the cat's out on the street, and it curls up on the foot of somebody. And so you're like, is that Harry? And then, of course, the light and the shadow and the disappearance and everything else. Yes. Yes, it sets up a good mystery in the first part of the film, enough that it gives you the breadcrumbs to follow if you've been paying attention, which I'll admit is a little bit hard because there's a lot being thrown at you in very quick order. The cutting on that and the editing, I think it might be a little too quick so you don't get to sit with some of the information that you're given. I know that the film is, you know, for being, I think, 104 minutes, it feels like a very quick 104 minutes. And some of that is by design. So I, I'm never going to be upset that a film is trying to be a little quicker than it has to be, except that I think you probably could have used a little bit more time, a little bit better transition, maybe a few more scenes of some character development in that early portion of the film that would have enhanced this out a little bit just for me. But that's me commenting on one of the great films of all time. So what the fuck do I know? Yeah. But to me, the entire movie leads up to the sewer chase. From the moment that Lime appears for the first time, and we have that famous, the light turns on and you see his face, to him escaping through the sewer system, and you know that that's going to be the climax of the film. And then that extended chase through the sewers, with the final moment being Martin's having to kill Lime, and him, I would say, giving permission to ha let him kill him, giving kind of that head nod of, yeah, it's okay. Then, uh, to me, that's what this entire film was leading towards, and if that scene is not right, then I don't think the rest of the movie works. Well, I have that scene as my most indelible moment, so I'll lead to that right off the bat, but it was so obvious that there was going to end up being some sort of major chase, and that Lime was going to be discovered and cornered that I just had a hard time picking it as my best scene because I think really once Lime appeared, it was inevitable that there was going to be a chase and a capture or a, a, a death. And so I couldn't go with the best scene for something that I thought was obvious. That's fair enough. I do have the appearance though, as my favorite scene again, because of the, I would say technical aspect of it, whether it's down to the the leading breadcrumbs of the cat and everything that we've had before it to the shoes appearing. And that's all we get of him so far to eventually how you depict him for the first time with the light from the window above shining down and then just getting this very quick reveal with obviously one of the more charismatic faces of the 1940s with Orson Welles and him just having that kind of knowing smile. The I would say almost like the James Bond type of smirk. It it sinks into my mind, and it's really, again, where I think this movie starts to pick up and have true propulsion through the end of the film. Yeah, the pace quickens. Everything else up to that point is the setup, and now the film really takes off. You know, it's like watching the uh, Kentucky Derby. 
the horse is getting into the gate and all that. And then it's when the gun or the bell or whatever it is goes off and they start running. That's the point where Harry shows up. I would say that's an apt metaphor. What was your favorite? Uh, for me, it was the Porter murder. I thought that was, you know, how easily it's turned on uh, very little evidence other than just circumstances. Oh, I wanted to point out that when Lyme appears, one of the th the first thoughts that crossed my mind, the cat's walking around his feet. This film was 1949. There's almost no difference in black wingtip shoes between 1949 and 2024. You could go to Alan Edmonds or uh, Johnston Murphy and the same damn black wingtips are existing that were existing in 1949 that Orson Welles is wearing in that scene. Same thing. I just was floored as to how, how consistent that shoe has been. You don't mess with a classic. I guess. So anyway, but going back now to the uh, the the point that I was making, the little kid, you know, <laughs> causing such a disturbance and really being the the device which uh, draws suspicion on Holly. Just I thought it was just a a, a really cute scene and uh, kind of gave you a kind of a of a lull in the 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 whole process involved, I guess. However. So you already gave your most indelible moment. I'll give mine here and I will encourage everyone to, if you can, while listening to our podcast, you can put this on over the top of our voices. It won't distract in any way, but the score, just find it on YouTube and play it over the top of us. You have my permission. You won't be disrupted at all. In fact, I would say it will enhance our podcast, and I would probably put this on in the background of this pod if I could get the licensing for the music. So that'll take us to our second break. We'll be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, releasing at the beginning of February, friend of the show Adam Hitchcock of the Streaming Circuit Podcast and I are back with our special monthly series on the Marvel Cinematic Universe where we will be discussing each film from the original Iron Man up through Avengers Endgame. The first half of each show will be on his feed, and on the second half, we will apply the Stan Lee rubric to each film to determine the greatest Marvel film of all time. This month, we're covering Captain America, the Winter Soldier from 2014. Don't miss out. Make sure you are subscribed to both feeds to get these episodes. Dad, do we have anyone to remember this week? Yes, we do. Conrad Chase, 58, American actor, singer, and reality television contestant. Gran Hermano. Herbert Coward, 85, American actor, was in the movie Deliverance. Cheetah Rivera, 91, American actress, was in the movies Chicago, Sweet Charity, and Tick, Tick, Boom. The recipient of a record 10 Tony Award nominations and winner of two for The Rink, in the Kiss of the Spider Woman. Rivera's unparalleled Broadway career spanned decades from playing Anita in West Side Story and opposite Dick Van Dyke in Bye Bye Birdie to signature Bob Fosse musicals like Chicago and All That Jazz. Jesse Jane, 43, American pornographic actress. Pirates, Pirates 2, Stagnetti's Revenge and host of Naughty Amateur Home Videos. She had an uncredited appearance in Baywatch, Hawaiian Wedding, and appeared in the reality TV series Family Business. She was a guest star on the HBO drama series Entourage. She also appeared in the reality series Bad Girls Club and Gene Simmons' Family Jewels. And so with that... We recognize these here for their contributions to the arts with a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. Let's move to best funniest lines. <laughs> Harry Lime, don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. Like the fella says, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. 
They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Yeah. I mean, he has a point. Oh, I know. Holly Martins. Have you ever seen any of your victims? Harry Lyme. You know, I never feel comfortable on these sort of things. Victims? Don't be melodramatic. Look down there. Tell me. Would you really feel any pity uh, if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spare? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. The only way you can save money nowadays. Holly Martins. As soon as I get to the bottom of this, I'll get the next plane. Major Calloway. Death's at the bottom of everything, Martins. Leave death to the professionals. Martins. Mind if I use that line in my next Western? Harry or Harry Lime. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't. Why should we? They talk about the people in the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. They have their five-year plans. So have I. Holly Martins. You used to believe in God. Harry Lime. Oh, I still do believe in God, old man. I believe in God and mercy and all that. But the dead are happier dead. They don't miss much here, poor devils. Anna Schmidt. A person doesn't change just because you find out more. Holly Martins. Oh, Anna, why do we always have to quarrel? Anna Schmidt. If you want to sell your services, I'm not willing to be the price. I loved him. You loved him. What good have we done him? Love, look at yourself. They have a name for faces like that. Holly Martins. Who was the third man? Anna Schmidt. Oh, please, for heaven's sake, stop making him in your image. Harry was real. He wasn't just your friend and my lover. He was Harry. I'm out. I am too. Okay, so then let's go to the Stanley rubric here. Legacy is up first. Do you want to go first or second? Go ahead. I think it's another one of these. We've done this now a couple of weeks in a row, but it's an inarguable for me five from the industry. It is a highly regarded film, both from a technical aspect, but also of, I would say the early golden age of Hollywood. It's a seminal performance by at least two of the best actors of the 1940s or most renowned actors of the 1940s. It is on all of these lists up and down of the best movies. It's got high ratings on just about any site that you can tell for any of its critics or anybody evaluating the film. I go for a five on the industry. I don't really think it's it's much for debate. You can debate me on it, of course, if you wish, but I don't think it's it's much of an argument. But on the public side of it, I don't know if you did any of our informal polling this week, but one thing we're going to be trying out here in the near future is we're going to be taking informal polls on our social media accounts leading into these movies to hopefully add to, you know, name recognition, actor or performance director recognition, et cetera, to give us a little bit more feedback to work on these categories. Because right now, we're just spitballing it. I think our line has always been, if I walked up and down State Street in Madison, which is a fairly famous foot traffic pathed walkway because it's it's sectioned off from... Between the University Union and the Capitol. But it's sectioned off from normal, regular traffic, so it's all foot traffic. But if we walked up and down that, and given that Madison is also a little bit more liberal, a lot more, I would say high-minded culture, possibly better film fans, you'd get a, I would say, jaded sample. But if we walked up and down State Street and did a poll or a random poll of 100 people, how many people would have heard of this movie? Now, if you're doing that on State Street, the likelihood is is that I would say maybe it's one in four has heard of the movie. Maybe one in five, one in six might have seen the movie. Obviously, I think the cultural impact of Orson Welles, you may get like one out of every three people that probably at least knows who Orson Welles is, even if they may not associate him with this film. And given that it wasn't one that he wrote or directed, and because he's only a small portion of the film, I don't know if that connection alone 
gives you a lot to go on for the legacy of this film necessarily. So you're relying a lot on, have people heard of this film? Now, again, this was not something that even I as a film fan knew until I started really digging into film and kind of got, I would say, an obsession with finishing the AFI and the best picture lists. But once I did, it was always one that stuck around with me. So I think this is going to be a slight gradation between, as Kieran put it two weeks ago, film fans and the general public that aren't necessarily part of the podcast culture or like create content around movies, just people that enjoy movies. So people like from my discussion group here in town. And then on top of it, just the general public at large that doesn't watch any movies which I'm not even sure that's necessarily fair to include the people that don't watch like any movies at all. Like my friend Ben, who maybe watches two movies a year because he's always hunting. Like, is he a really great barometer of whether this movie lives on in the legacy of culture? I mean, if he has no impetus to see a film or care about film or film history at all, what's it really worth? Point being that... I'm stuck hovering between about a one and a two. I think that the general movie going population, the ones that go to like Pixar films and maybe will show up for like a John Wick type of thing. The crowd that only need explosions, horror films or animated films. I I'm stuck between a one and a two because I think the film fans, the, let's say more high minded, the film study people would be recognizing of this film, but not necessarily the public at large. So I have a 6.5. I went with a 4.5 for the industry. Yes, it's in all the categories and everything, but even then, I don't know if it's really held up as well. It's not, if you ask other than like film critics, I mean, even people who like films to name a top 100 list, I'm not sure how many people would remember this film to include. If you mentioned it, they would go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That probably should have been on there. Okay, so I went down a half a point for that because it's not one that's right immediately. You know, you say it and everybody knows immediately. Oh, yes, yes. I did not go down as much as you did with the public. Because the little bit of research I did, which is that in Europe and England, or in Great Britain itself, this is held by the public a little bit more than it is in the United States because of it being considered the greatest British film. So I went with a 2.5 for that. So I'm at 4.5 and 2.5, so I'm at 7 overall. So that's a 6.75 average between the two of us. Impact and significance. In the moment of its release, it was kind of treated as somewhat of an international film as opposed to an American one. And so because it didn't have the backing of one of the major studios, the fact that it even got nominated for several things in the Oscars is somewhat telling. Also notably, this was released the year after the Oscars was shocked that a British film would win an American award for Hamlet (laughs) for reference sake. But additionally, outside of, I think basically Austria, the critics were pretty well convinced that this was a really good film. I think it takes some of its cues from, I would say similar films like Hitchcock's films in Britain before he left. When we did the lady vanishes, it's got a lot of lady vanishes, aspect to it. It's got some level of the original British version of the man who knew too much elements to it. So I think there is an, a broad strokes thriller element of this era of British film that somewhat applies generally to this. And this is probably one of the more stylized versions of it. The fact that it's still held in such esteem I think aids to it, but I have about a four for the industry. And then as far as the public, while it wasn't necessarily a huge hit in the United States, at least right away, it was a hit in the UK. And I think adding to it is the fact that you had a best-selling score. 
not like individual songs from the soundtrack. This wasn't like the soundtrack for the bodyguard or something like that. <laughs> but the fact that you had a film score that stuck in the minds as an earworm, like it has for me for many years at this point and become like a best selling album within that five year period. I'm going to go for a four on that as well. So I have an eight. I also have a four for the industry for a lot of the same reasons, which is it had nominations. It did well. It did. Even though it was considered a British film, I think it did better than I thought, or that a lot of people thought it was going to. And for the public, I had to give it kudos because it was the big, you know, it was the po- most popular film of that year in Britain. And it did okay in the United States. It wasn't great, but I have to give it kudos to its native country and what, how well it did. So I went the four also, so I'm at an eight. So we have a social word, a perfect eight. All right, pour some out for one's homies. So that's an eight average between the two of us. Mm-hmm. I really had to break out the calculator on that one. Yeah. Novelty. The camera work, the zither score, which I think is entirely unique. The post-war atmosphere in an occupied country, which I can't really name too many other films of this that would use this kind of setting. The execution in this is marvelous from both a cinematography, a score, a stage setting, a costuming, etc., And I would be willing to say this is probably as close to a one of one novelty on its uniqueness factor and its execution. But there's just something that stops me from going a full 10. So I'm going to go with a 9.5. It's still simply a film noir. The story itself and the execution of the story and the script is not that novel. It's not unique the story is relatively unusual. The film and the execution of it is. So I'm giving it points up, but I can't go to your 9.5 because the underlying premise is not that novel. So I'm at an eight. I don't know. I I find that the use of the setting in a more contemporary sense, when there were not many films being made about this era of time, particularly about post-war Europe, where you can still see all the rubble from all the fallout. I think for the most part, we just kind of skip over this period of history when we're thinking about film and film culture. The Zither score, which is a one of one, the variety of the amount of Dutch angles in this one. I mean, this is one of the more renowned, quote unquote, Dutch angle films. You'll see it occasionally used once or twice in certain things, and they are noticeable because it does create a certain level of unease. But this is famous for it. I think that there are too many other technical things that go into this that make it part of that. But if you want to say that's partly just on an execution basis as opposed to the story itself, and you want to focus solely on that as the big picture, I guess I won't have too much of an argument I guess rationalizing why I went as high as I did, because even though the subject material may not be the most unique, I'll grant you that you have some points on that part of the board. I still think that the other stuff outweighs it for me, because if I'm trying to look at something for any one of those technical pieces, it's a one of one. But I also understand that because maybe the story holds it back, a 9.5 might be the reason I didn't go a full 10. Well, I'll go to an 8.5 because you do make some good points with the the score and the Dutch angles and all that. I think it is probably more than a little bit more, than, or it is a little more than the simple execution. So I'll go with an 8.5. So that'll be a nine average between the two of us. Classicness. You know, starting out where we know we normally do it about a seven, there's very little about this that's not classic. I mean, we have fairly strong characters. We have well-defined protagonists. We have well-defined sub-characters. There's nothing in it that's wrong. It kind of hinted as to the turning into the Cold War by how things were being done between the British zone and the Russian zone and all of that. So I had a nine- 
overall because I couldn't find any flaws. I might go up to a 9.5 if you can convince me. I think you'll probably stay at your 9 then. Okay. While I won't have complaints on some of the traditional stuff we think about in this category, namely, we do have a fairly strong female protagonist, you could make commentary that Holly is a little bit unnecessarily chivalrous, and that might be a, a point against the film, but I think that's undercut by her basically throwing it back in his face. I think to a degree, that's actually a very classic role reversal of what I would consider maybe like a second age type of feminist angle to the film that I definitely don't see in a lot of its contemporaries from 1949. I think most times the female characters are fairly thinly drawn. And this one, while I don't think that we get enough character depth as to how she really was drawn to Harry, you can see the loyalty there and it does draw a lot for her character to be able to expound on that, and it doesn't feel necessarily forced. So there is an angle to this where I'll even give that somewhat of a pass. But one of the things that really stuck out to me every time it was mentioned, there's just something that bugs me about supposedly diluted penicillin causing kids more harm than not having any penicillin at all. Like, that doesn't even compute to me, and I'm not the type of person that is a doctor, plays one on TV, or is a social security attorney who fashions himself basically a medical professional. So I don't know if there is something to that or not, but it seems a little far-fetched to me that even a little bit of medicine would possibly help, even though they make it seem like he was giving them, or the diluted penicillin was basically giving them a virus or something that, like, made them go mad. It, it makes no sense to me. Okay. But there's an element of timelessness in this. So even if I were to start at the seven, I think I probably add a couple of extra points just for its age, how well it's lasted. The fact that even though uh, it was contemporary at its time, I could feel that this is somewhat so contemporarily well made that it feels like a period piece, even though it's not. And as we've mentioned previously in like the did you know section, we mentioned Scorsese and I can see shades of this in like the departed and shutter Island. And because I can assume due to its reverence in the industry at large, which I mentioned in legacy before, I think it's influential on other films as well. So whether you want to say that should be in the legacy portion of things, that's part of the reason that I gave it a five. I still think that this movie does have a significant impact on filmmakers. That's why I mentioned it's the film lovers or the filmmakers film. It's something that will come up among the film culture that isn't necessarily something that will be to the rest of us. So I had an 8.5. Okay. So I'll stick with my nine. So that's an 8.75 average between the two of us. Rewatchability. I loved this film. Yes. I was hoping so. I really did. I thought, I thought it was the, it was again, I I've, I'm finding that films that sometimes can be so simple and executed perfectly in their simplicity are some of my favorite films. Well, that's approximately what you said about past lives earlier this year. Yes. And I think it's the same thing that's going here. So I have a 7.5 for rewatchability because Ooh. this is, what? You think that's low? I would have thought you would have gone higher. Uh, I'll go up to an eight. Rewatchability to me, that nine in the ten is something I'm going to rewatch over and over. Blazing Saddles rewatchability is a ten to me because it doesn't matter what kind of mood I'm in or what I'm doing. If I'm going to, you know, I'll throw Blazing Saddles on because it's just Blazing Saddles. A nine is a film that I regularly watch. This is one that I really would love to sit down and watch again with some people that have never experienced it or are unfamiliar with it. You know, this is one that's a Friday or Saturday night when your grandmother's with us in the summers and uh, it's your mother and I and your grandmother and we're sitting around. This is one I'll throw on because I think they would really enjoy it. 
I think so too. I know that uh, when she was laid up with her knee surgery, I had her watch a bunch of different films. This was not necessarily one of them, but it very well easily could be. Yeah. My likelihood to put it on of my own volition, I have it in this master playlist of movies that I put on in the background when I'm just like working on mindless stuff, like attaching scans at the office or something to that effect when it's just like data entry or data transfer. But I mean, I just watched Anatomy of a Murder, and this movie could very easily be in a similar place where I'm just kind of half watching it because it's a fun movie. Mm-hmm. And especially for the first half, I really don't need to pay attention that much. I know exactly where it's going to end up. And the mystery to me isn't nearly as good as the propulsive action, the thriller portion of this film. So yeah. I think that once it hits that point in the movie or even just a little bit short where I know it's coming I have no problem finishing this film so I can't get to a full five that I will finish it if it's 20 minutes in and we haven't gotten anywhere close to the point where Harry Lime shows up yet my likelihood to kind of like stop and then maybe come back to it later is a little bit higher so I have a 4.5 on that side of it but I have a four that I would probably put it on of my own volition it's not something that I'm going to just go out of my way to put on but it's not something that I would object to either It's going to be one of those kind of rotational ones where I know it's a fun, it's a easily enjoyable film and one that I can just kind of mindlessly watch. So I have an 8.5 that will make the average between the two of us an 8.25. For audience score, we had an 83% for Google users and a 93% for Rotten Tomato users, giving us a 8.8 overall. So to recap the categories, we had a 6.75 for Legacy, an 8 for impact and significance, a 9 for novelty, an 8.75 for classicness, an 8.25 for rewatchability, and an 8.8 for audience score, giving us a final total of 49.55. And currently placing it on our list between It's a Wonderful Life and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Hmm. Okay. That feels about where it should belong. Yeah. I have no problem with its placement on the list there. As always, if you have any commentary for our scores or have any disagreements with us, you can write us at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com or on any of our socials at gmotepodcast on YouTube, Instagram, X, Letterboxd, or TikTok. Remaining questions. We already kind of went through one. Was Harry always a heel or did he just turn out to be that way? We kind of addressed that at the beginning of the show. I guess my biggest one is is it's a bit of an ambiguous ending, but does Martin stay permanently in Vienna? Why? Harry's dead. She's has wants nothing to do with him. But I think there's a portion of him that may be pining after her. <laughs> okay. I mean, how and I much think he more... is a bit of a wishy-washy character. There's nothing there for him at this point in time. He's going to go back. Okay. I mean, I I could see him staying. I'm not sure why. I agree with you that it's, it doesn't make rational sense. But I think at this point, he's kind of an irrational character. <laughs> okay. Did you have any remaining questions? No, I think the only one I had was we already covered, as you said. All right. I guess we'll give this one. Who was the third man? It's Harry. Yeah, if you haven't figured out the central mystery behind it, the person who actually was hit and then they staged the rest of it, was the guy who ends up in the coffin and in his grave, but then everybody's convinced or paid off to say it was Harry, and Harry was the third man. Yes. All right, then. Uh, I think that is uh, enough for the film. Do you have any final thoughts for the week? No, I I'm, I'm, uh, was looking through the uh, Academy Award nomination list, realized I've seen quite a few of the films that are on there. Um, you I'm usually hoping- do about this point. You're welcome. Yes, I'm going to be spending some time on a business trip here next week, and um, uh, I should have some extra time in the uh, hotel. I may try and get a few of them in, like some of the uh, shorts or the documentaries that are available on streaming, in addition to the fact that football is now wave, or, uh, winding down, and I can start focusing on uh, college basketball leading into the uh, March Madness. So I'll just tell you that the shorts are going to be very hard to find. I see. Okay. But I am 
20 minutes away, half an hour away from finishing all of the top categories. And now I'll be probably going into my rewatches here pretty soon. I have a feeling that a couple of movies I'm hoping will maybe shuffle around or change for me. There are a few that I saw either a while ago or that I want to have a new impression on or something to that effect. Holdovers is in that conversation. I was not necessarily bowled over by American fiction, and I'm kind of wondering why, because I was so jazzed for that film when I saw it, and I don't know. I, I need to see it again to make sure I, I understood what my impression was or if I might have overhyped it too much for myself. Because I will say that it took me probably three watches to finally understand the marvel that was Oppenheimer. I had it rated highly, but I was disappointed initially a little bit with the film. It didn't quite hit me in the same way that it did other things, but it was still at the top of my list. Once I got through it about the third time, I would say that it really did change and went from a movie that I admired to one that I revered. And I think that's hopefully what I can do with a couple of other ones. It's also been, I would say, probably about six months since I saw like Past Lives and Barbie. So those should be fairly easy rewatches that I go back to and uh, see if my opinion moves them up or down. There are other ones that I don't feel like I really need to see again, but I already have all 10 nominees in. And so by that extent, I have most of the major categories pretty much already done and most of the technical ones. Probably about three to four of all the technical categories are from the 10 nominees. So for the most part, save for watching all the shorts, which I've created playlists of, and trying to get through all of the animated films yet, which not all of them are available either yet either. Yeah. Then um, I don't have a whole lot left on the Oscars this year, kind of like last year where I was surprised. It was the first time I had watched all the Best Picture nominees before the nominations had actually come out. This year I got to nine, but I have seen Zone of Interest since. Well, your comment about Oppenheimer, I, I, I stopped to think about it. As a historian, okay, in these biopics, and I know you have some problems with biopics and some <laughs> and such, but for me, okay, if the history itself is fairly accurate, and I why I say fairly accurate, I mean it doesn't make great cinema, you know, to be you know strict. If they can get about seventy five percent of it historically accurate, okay, but what a biopic for me does is it takes the dry history and adds the emotional element to it. And that's why I enjoy them, because it lifts the history into a stratosphere that I do not normally get to experience. And so when I watched Oppenheimer, having read and studied, I mean, I, I we did the whole evaluation of whether we should have dropped the atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki back while I was in college in the, well, it would have been 1985, 86. Yeah. The prehistoric era. Yes. Okay. You know, so I've studied this for a number of years, read a number of books, read a number of articles. The movie itself interjected the humanity in it the emotion, the the angst that the people were feeling, both by being scientists and then by the moral conflict that they were feeling about it. And so when I saw that and I saw how well it was executed and how it triggered an emotional sense in me, the conflict that I had always wondered how these people functioned, that's what struck a chord with me. That's when, when I walked out and said, this is probably the best film I've seen produced in this, this century so far, in the last 23 years. And I stand by that for that very reason. Nolan was in a way to strike a chord that took individuals living history, doing a job and function, and presenting it in a very humane way that transcended just the facts that brought an emotional aspect to the film that I thought was wonderful. 
again, from a movie that I admired, I could understand its technical marvel and all the things that it was accomplishing. I could break it down into its individual parts, but it was not a movie that I connected with until about my third watch. And when I say I don't like biopics, it's because most of them just go from point A to point B to point C on this roadmap of somebody's Wikipedia page of their life. (laughs) Okay. We're going to explore this moment in their life. And then we're going to do this moment in their life. And we're going to do this moment. And it's just, it's boring. It, It may as well be a visual Wikipedia entry. It's my problems that I had with Napoleon. It didn't really have a lot externally to say about the man. It didn't have a larger gravitas to give us some better context or give an interpretation on what this life meant, not only to history and whatever else. It's the lone exception that I have for Oppenheimer that it crosses all of those lines. To me, it mixes both biopic and courtroom drama. And so it really is, in essence, putting a person of history on trial, but using the transcript of their own trial as the basis for doing so. So it's creative and inventive in that sense. But then on top of it, where I really thought that the film, I guess, shines, is the emotional grappling not only for us as the audience, for what his life meant, but his own internal angst and struggle with what his life meant not only to him, but to the world at large. And that personal turmoil is why I personally would have Murphy at the top of my best actor list at the moment. I'll see what happens on some of these rewatches if anybody kind of shifts around in that category for me. But his ability to play a very flawed character with, I would say, a fairly easy God complex. I mean, if you're the creator of destruction, I am death, essentially. Prometheus. Correct. Why wouldn't you have a God complex? But to also have the moral ambiguity to know that you might have destroyed the world in a chain reaction and have that be the final moment of the film is this just look of bewilderment. I mean, I'm still puzzled over the last 30 seconds of the movie. And yet, going against your argument, I still don't think I would say it's Nolan's best film. Okay. I think I personally, as far as greatness, obviously we have one of his films at the top of our list currently. You know my personal affinity for Inception, but I'm not sure I would put that at the top of the list. I'm going to be a little bit off the beaten path, and I still think Dunkirk is his best film. Except there, to me, Dunkirk does not have the emotional chops that you would want. I can understand that, but being as I'm one of the few people that actually saw it in IMAX, that was a different experience seeing it in that large a format with that level of excess sound creating an atmosphere that was like surviving the beaches of Dunkirk. To me, that was more of a cinematic experience than anything else. And I think that's one of the rare things that Nolan has is creating a true cinematic experience for the audience who is consuming his films. You really, he's one of the few people that, If you have a chance to see his movies, you need to see them in a theater as opposed to any other venue. And I'm somebody who enjoys the comforts of watching pretty much any film at home. Most of these small dramas or these small intimate things, I don't mind being smaller and intimate on my TV at home with my couch and, you know, a warm cup of coffee or something. You like being intimate with your couch? Who doesn't? Mm. Okay. Anyway. But the point being that he's one of the rare exceptions that I would say defies that. And even he understands the responsibility he has in comments that I think he made yesterday that he's going to continue to make these giant scale movies because he has resources nobody else is being given and he knows how to use them. So as long as he's willing to make movies and really, I think I've only been burned personally as far as (laughs) what I would consider by one of his movies, Tenet. I will continue to watch every one of his films as long as he's willing to make them. Yeah. And thankfully, he's only in, I think, his late 50s. So he's probably got another 20 years. Is he that old? I think he's like 57. Pull out the Google machine. Oh, no, he's 53. Okay. He's still a young man. He's got 30 or he's got 20 years easily before he's going to start slowing down. And if he basically is willing to hike his uh, belt buckle under his chin, like, <laughs> like uh, uh, Eastwood. Under his chin. 
pretty much to his nipples. <laughs> his nipples that have been recently licked on a different episode. <laughs> He's, yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, speaking he can of which, we got an opportunity to potentially discuss that uh, movie in its entirety if you want to. Oh, we did, huh? Yeah. Our guest from that episode would like to record a full uh, episode on just the rookie. Oh, well, I think that would be uh, that would be kind of fun. Yeah, except I think there's only probably about a half an hour's worth of material before it'll just become kind of um, us ripping the film. Well, we're ripping the film to begin with. But I think, you know, there's only so much you can say about that film unless you're like dissecting the reverse rape over and over and over again, <laughs> like the Sapruder film. Well, let's play it back. What happened there? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I think we've we've carried on way further than people were uh, hoping to have. So I'm going to cut it here. That's it for us this week. Thank you for listening. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Next week for our 200th episode, yes, you heard that right, our 200th episode, we discuss the highest inflation-adjusted grossing film of all time with Gone with the Wind, celebrating its 85th anniversary. Directed by Victor Fleming, written by Sidney Howard, music by Max Steiner, starring Clark Gable, Vivian Lee, Patty McDaniel, and Olivia de Havilland. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that more can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at thenewronnyduncanstudios.com or at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Find our new Facebook page under Greatest Movie of All Time Podcast, or find us on YouTube, Instagram, X, Letterboxd, or TikTok at the handle at Gmote Podcast. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM.